Thanks again. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Abby Gadowski. I am the policy intern working with Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, I would like to welcome you to this briefing on House Resolution 662, which honors the victims of post 9-11 hate crimes. We really do hope that you decide to support this resolution and help seek justice for these victims. Um, now I'd like to introduce the Legislative Director for Congresswoman um, Eddie Bernice Johnson, Nazid Lada. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Bakr and uh, Mohammed from Muslim Public Affairs Council uh, for helping to put this event together. Thank you to uh, Arias for that wonderful video and um, you know the work him and Jessica and the rest of the team at World Without Hate um, do every day. Um, unfortunately, I'll say a few words here. Unfortunately, Congresswoman Johnson, who was supposed to speak here, um, isn't able to make it due to votes, which should go off maybe while I'm speaking. We'll see. Um, you guys will hear bells. Um, but, you know, without the tireless work of both MPAC and World Without Hate, um, we wouldn't be here today, uh, frankly put, you know, speaking about House Resolution 662, uh, which was introduced last year by Congresswoman Johnson. And then there was a previous version of this as well, which I'll definitely go into. Um, so, you know, Congresswoman Johnson, after the nine, after the September 11th terrorist attacks, um, there were there were a few things going on at that time, um, which sort of, you know, kept this front of mind to her. Um, first, you know, one of the major things that happened was President Bush going to a mosque, you know, less than a week after 9-11. I think, you know, Congresswoman Johnson, along with myself, believed that this was an act that prevented numerous other hate crimes that could have possibly taken place um, to show that, you know, we stand with the American Muslim community as Americans and, and, and that these people are not our enemies was immensely important in, in, in ensuring that, you know, uh, there weren't more hate crimes committed than there were. Um, around that same time, also, you know, the Congresswoman in previous years had worked together with the United Nations Security Council and other groups to form a women, peace and security initiative um, around, uh, you know, women's security in conflict areas. Uh, it was United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which was passed in 2000. And um, I bring that up because the Congresswoman found this organization, this nonprofit in Dallas called World of Women for World Peace. And during the process of, you know, having these yearly events about, um, you know, global peace in different re regions of the world, um, come 2011, she hears about Rice, who was in her congressional district, uh, a victim of hate crimes after September 11th. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll let him basically pick up the story from there when it comes to his plea of, uh, you know, saving his attacker's life. Um, and so the congresswoman invited him over to speak at, at one of these events. And that sort of, you know, uh, jump-started the relationship with Congressman Johnson and, and Rice to work on a resolution recognizing these victims of hate crimes that took place after uh, September 11th. And, um, you know, inter introduced back in um, uh, 2015, you know, we introduced House Resolution 413, which was the predecessor to um, HRS 662. Um, and then, you know, uh, 2021 comes around and the, it's the 20th anniversary of these chair uh, of these terrible attacks. And um, these victims had still not been recognized. These victims had still not received the acknowledgement that you were victims of hate crimes um, from our federal government. And so from that end, we pushed to introduce House Resolution 662. Um, we've gotten five or six co-sponsors right now. And um, I wanna thank those offices for uh, supporting uh, this resolution. And we are hoping to get more and try to get this through uh, this Congress. Um, I know time is short, but you know, anything is possible. Um, and, and so when you think about hate, when you think about you know, hate and the history of our country, it's been something that we've seen prevalent. It's been something that we've seen throughout the history, whether it was Jim Crow laws, whether it was the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, um, or more recently, you know, hate crimes committed against Asian Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, hate crimes for after 9-11 is something that is overlooked, but yet these 
victims, their families, um, the other individuals that were impacted by these actions of individuals, uh, you know, speaking of hate, um, these deserve to be recognized. These deserve to be acknowledged. These deserve, you know, as Rice said, the healing process needs to begin. And 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 one of the and one of those prospects is to recognize that hey, these events did take place. And that's simply what this resolution does. It highlights that not just Muslims, but Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, uh, people, all Arabs, all you know, South Asians um, were during this period, you know. Uh, could have been discriminated against, could have been um, verbally harassed, physically uh, physically attacked um, during this period. And, and this is something that, you know, we wanna make sure that is recognized, especially with uh, the victims that we recognize in, in, in the resolution. Um, and so um, this is one of those things that we wanna make sure that we're able to get through uh, this Congress and, and, and make sure that this recognition is, is, is given to these families that justice is served, um, that there is an acknowledgement. Um, and, you know, there's been one person who's been walking the halls here for the past year, um, constantly working with Congresswoman Johnson's office, you know, uh, meeting with other congressional offices, trying to get them to sign on. And, and, and he's been spearheading, he's been spearheading this, this uh, resolution from the outside. And, and that is Rice, and I want to introduce him right now um, to you guys and let him say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Nawaid, for the kind introduction. Thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Thank you. I stand before you today, my face and his skull peppered with more than three dozen shotgun pellets. I have no vision in one eye. I suffer from PTSD. These, all are, these are just some of the ramifications of the terror that rained down upon our country on September 11, 2001. And I'm not alone. Fear and anger channeled towards innocent people, blamed for 9-11, resulted in historic increases of hate fuel violence. Although, not in Manhattan or Washington, D.C. on September 11th, 2001. I am a victim and survivor of 9-11. As a nation, we come together each year, rightfully so, to remember and support for the victims and survivors. However, innocent victims of 9-11 hate remain unnoticed, while our pain, trauma, and health ramifications continue. In 2015, I reached out to Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson in hopes of bringing some closure and recognition to these victims, families, and survivors. While House Resolution 413 was introduced by the Congresswoman, we did not receive enough support for passage. As we marked 20th anniversary of 9-11, we tried once again. House Resolution 662 was introduced on September 21st, 2001, the anniversary of my shooting. Currently, this resolution is under review by the House, led by House Judiciary and Oversight Committees. Over the last several months, I have knocked on many of your doors respectfully requesting you for the support of House Resolution 662. More importantly, requesting your support for the value of innocent human life, no matter skin color or religion. Today, I ask you, I ask you to support House Resolution 662 with your conscience. If we were your loved ones, what would you do? This is not a political or partisan issue. This is a human issue. This is an American issue. 
your efforts in getting more support in passing this resolution is a choice of morality, unity, and upholding our American values. Legendary Texas Congresswoman Barbara Jordan once said that what people want is very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. Passing this resolution would be a symbol, a symbol would be a symbol of the American promise to the victims' families and survivors of 9-11 hate. I ultimately forgave my attacker and campaign to save his life from Texas death row because every human life matters. I implore my country, my government, to acknowledge that hate crime victims of 9-11 lives matter too. Ultimately, condemning hate fuel violence against any and all Americans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch. Um, Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch is president and CEO of Interfaith Alliance. An ordained Baptist minister, Reverend Rauschenbusch is a longtime leader in the interfaith movement, working to protect an inclusive vision of religious freedom for people of all faiths and none. I'd like to invite the panelists to come forward now, um, just so that we I can have a chance to introduce them. So if people who are going to be on the panel could come forward and, and join me uh, at the podium now, that would be great. And then we can get going right away. So I believe we are Rice, that includes you, um, as well as um, Ms. Duri Aslam, uh, and Muhammad Bakur and uh, Muhammad Ali. I want to start by saying I'm joined by uh, my associate, uh, Ria, and my a board member, Simran, who come here in solidarity with uh, with impact with um, with uh, world without hate and with all of you for this important event, uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to uh, show up and be present and to be among the groups that have come together in memories of the victims of hate and violence after 9/11 and in solidarity and support for the families of those who were murdered. I feel so called to this moment to be with all of you and I invite all of you to consider feeling called to this moment, to action, to making this happen. I'm here as a Christian, as a minister, as an interfaith leader who has worked with all people of all faith and no faith to bring the religious communities together just for such an event as this. Most of all here, I come here as an American and as a patriot who demands that America recognize the suffering of the people and pass resolution 662 so that long overdue healing can begin for the families of those who were murdered and for our nation, which has failed until this moment to be able to really recognize what happened and move forward. This is an important moment. This is an historic moment. Let's recognize what we're doing here today. We need to do this now, during the next few weeks. I know, I heard, I heard the gentleman earlier say, nothing is impossible, actually, if you decide to do it. And that's what I'm here to say. This is not a partisan issue. This is a moral issue. This is a decency issue. This is a justice issue. And I'm just the president of one of the organizations that signed on to this effort, Interfaith Alliance. But we represent millions of people. The people who have signed on to this represents the will of the American people, the will of the religious people. 
And I raise my voice alongside my neighbors and friends in this room, but also across the nation, urging the House Judiciary Committee to move this bill forward to a vote and move Congress to pass Resolution 662 so that the American people and America as a whole can have resolution about the aftermath of 9-11. So again, thank you. I am so honored to have been invited to be a part of this panel and to be next to this group of people. It is, it, it is extraordinary. So on to our panel. I'm going to do the introductions and then we're going to hear from our, our panelists, but I'm going to do the introductions one after another. Just get, um, um, actually, I just changed my mind on that. I'm going to introduce people and then I'm going to have them um, say a few words and then I'll introduce the next person. So I'm going to start with Muhammad Ali, Director of Policy at MPAC, who has served as a Senate advisor for seven years before entering into the world of advocacy. I wonder if you could start us off. Yeah, and this is something that I was going to mention in my uh, remarks to close out. You know, as I was an advisor, a lot of times we would, uh, I would have to um, come up with the answer to the question is, well, who is supporting it and how many people? I was representing, uh, you know, my boss was representing the kids in Minnesota. And a lot of times it's like, well, how many people are actually asking us to do this? There's a difference between, you know, doing the right thing and are we doing the right thing by who it is of our constituency? You know, what is it they want? If we get our voice, our message to those elected officials who work in this in this building, we've got a chance in getting this passed. But if we don't, it's going to make it that much more difficult. So the choice is up to us. Do we go forward and support and ask for their support, or do we not? I don't think there's any reason for why we should not. So I think that if all of us are able to get behind, you know, calling your elected officials, reaching out to them, calling your friend. I mean, it's just like a calling campaign at times. Um, organizations, I think we're around 30, Bakr, is that correct? 30 to 35 or so? Get, uh, you know, everybody here has, um, you know, a network of folks who are in those organizations. Get them to sign on to the coalition letter that we're going to circulate, uh, you know, to members of Congress. It's the ball's in our court. I'll close with it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn next to um, Mohammed Bakr uh, Mujahideen. Uh, uh, Mohammed Becker serves as Senior Manager for Public um, Policy and, and Strategy at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And throughout his career, uh, Mohammed Becker uh, worked to address issues impacting Muslims in the United States, including matters related to discrimination, hate crimes, and immigration. Uh, Mohammed is, uh, is a native of Dearborn, Michigan which is home to the largest concentration of Arab, uh, Arabs in America. And prior to moving to Washington, D.C., Mohammed Bakker completed his master's in public policy at Michigan State University. Uh, Mohammed Bakker, why don't you uh, offer opening reflections on, on what, what, what brings you here professionally, but also personally? Sure, Reverend. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, and, and, and we are honored to, to be here with you as well. Um, so. I will reflect personally right now, just on 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 my experience with with September 11, and uh, you know, well, then it will lead over to the you know the experience of of uh, Mrs. Dora and and and, and Mr. Race. Uh, my experience at the time when when 11 happened, I was a student in high school uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, which is you know you know the Arab city of America. At the same time, it's it's the Muslim city of America. Uh, so my high school was overwhelmingly Muslim. Uh, that morning, we did have a half a day of school. Um, so, uh, and, you know, that was before the days of cell phones and, and, and communications where, you know, we find out what's going on, but we were finished school at 1030 in the morning and we were walking home and, and my best friend and his mom pulled in in a car saying, jump in, jump in, we're going home. We were supposed to go play tennis on that day or something, but we ended up, you know, our parents were terrified, uh, it took us and we went home and, and we stayed locked in, uh, our community, like the American Muslim community lost lost people in the Twin Towers. We also had people that survived the Twin Towers from our community, American and Arab Muslim community in Dearborn. At the same time, one of the nine individuals that are listed in this is a member of our community was, was, was also killed by a hate crime. Uh, this led to, to our community, like the, I, I remember one of, my, like one of the people that passed away in the towers is, 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 is a relative of one of, one of my friends and, and, and they were terrified to hold a funeral for him because of, of, of what was going on in the media. 
Um, added to that, our public high school, I, I mean, I, I, I cannot remember how many times, but for over the next month, the bomb threats were you know, every two, three days, we'd get sent home early due to bomb threats. Calls that were coming in from pay phones at the time and whatnot. So that's that's my personal experience with with that. Thanks a lot, Reverend. Thank you. Um, next on our panel, uh, I'm honored to um, introduce the story uh, Islam, an American Muslim, uh, who lost her husband as a result of 9/11 anti-Muslim sentiment. Left alone to raise their four children, Islam worked tirelessly to provide for her family while also ensuring them a bright and fulfilling future. Through, though Aslam still struggles economically and emotionally, she remains steadfast in her belief that America is a great country to live in, to achieve opportunity, prosperity, and most importantly, community. Would you offer us a your opening statement and testimony? Yes, yes like, uh, uh, hi everyone. My name is Dureshawar Aslam. Uh, I'm a victim of like hate crime. Like my husband get killed because of 9/11 in Dallas. I I was um, with my daughters at, at that time in New Jersey. I have four da four daughters, and I was housewife and just go to the grocery and pick up kids and drop off them school. And after my husband's death, I worked 14 years in a graveyard shift in, in a factory to provide for them, to comfort for them. I'm sorry, Ken. I don't know what to say. Like Brother Ray said, we just want them to be recognized as a hate, hate crime and linked to the 9-11 victims. I think that's, thank you so much. I'll just offer that your tears are testimony and we're with you. And we want people to really feel like and um, finally, on this panel, um, is Rice, our brother Rice. After Rice was shot by a white supremacist after 9 11, he not only survived this brutal hate crime, but forgave his attacker and led a global campaign advocating to save him from death row. From this movement, Julian, am I saying that correctly? Close enough? Okay, Julian. Founded World Without Hate. A nonprofit utilizing the transformational power of personal narrative and empathy to prevent and disrupt hate and violence. Over the last decade, Bouillon has spoken with hundreds of thousands of thousands of people around the globe working to help build safer, inclusive, and more accepted communities. Since 2015, Bouillon has worked closely with Congresswoman Johnson on the creation of an advocacy for HR 662 in hopes of honoring all those who were lost or suffered uh, due to 9 11 hate due to violence. Rice, could you say a little bit more about your personal reason for being here today? Well, thank you so much, Reverend Paul. Um, after graduating as a pilot officer from the Bangladeshi Air Force, I did not feel my destiny was there. I left my family, my home, and my career to come to US to study computer science. I was living in New York City, and right before 9-11, I moved to Dallas, Texas. A friend of mine invited me to visit, loved it very much, warm weather, tuition fee much cheaper, and more stable living condition. And I started working in this gas station. 10 days after 9-11 terrorist attacks, as the rescuers continued to search ground zero for signs of life. Our country in deep mourning a newfound fear and uncertainty looming. I begin what would be my last day of work as a store clerk in Southeast Dallas. Around noon, a man walked in wearing a bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap, 
pointing a sort of double barrel shotgun straight at my face. And he asked, where are you from? Before I could say anything more than excuse me, he pulled the trigger from point blank range. He left me for dead on a cold concrete continental minister floor. On my way to the hospital, I promised God that if you give me a chance to live, I would help others. Five hours after I was taken to hospital, which was private and expensive, I was put on life support. And the next day morning, I was told to, I was discharged from the hospital and was told to find follow-up treatments on my own. The second part of my American nightmare just began after I was discharged from the hospital. And as a result of the shooting, I underwent several eye surgeries, ultimately lost vision in one eye. My face and skull was and remains peppered with more than three dozen shotgun pellets. So when I touch my face, I can feel those pellets. It's all over my right side of the face. When my father heard what happened to me, he suffered a stroke but thankfully survived. I lost my fiance, lost my home, sense of security and my job, but gained, <laughs> but gained more than $60,000 in medical bills. And I reached out to Red Cross for help. And they told me I was qualified only for one week's worth of groceries. There is not a single thing that goes by that I'm not reminded of or affected by this painful tragedy, but I continue to make peace with my pain. I forgive my attacker and launched a global campaign to save his life from Texas death row. And he called me brother and he said he loved me because of the mercy, the forgiveness and the empathy that he received from the very people he once hated and he tried to kill. And before he was executed, his last words were, hate is going on everywhere. It has to be stopped. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. Thank you. These are the powerful testimonies that we're listening to today, and, and they represent a fraction of what happened after 9-11. Um, and, and so it's important to keep these like this absolute outbreak in front of us as we think about why we're doing this work and what it means. Um, but, but what it means is really important too, because what I, what I would like for the panel to address is um, the question, why this resolution? What would it do? Your pain is there, this happened. Why this resolution? And I'd love for you to speak into why it's important not to just let this go but actually recognize it to begin the healing. So I'd love for each of you to say a few words about why Resolution 662 matters in it directly addressing the pain and suffering that you have experienced. Um, whoever feels that this is in no particular order, I would like to hear from everybody. Um, so whoever feels called to start, I appreciate it. I can, I can kick it off, and this is something that I wanted to include in my remarks as well. You know, we can't begin the process of healing without addressing what it is that we are, you know, trying to heal from. This is that. This acknowledges the, the terror felt by those who have been killed, attacked, maimed um, in the aftermath of that tragic morning. And, and you know, the testimony you heard is, is what, you know, the, what, what everybody was feeling in, those, uh, in, in the aftermath. And so unless we acknowledge their pain, unless we are actually willing to accept that, 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 that those terrifying things happened, how are we going to be able to grow towards policy solutions to prevent that from going forward? And before that, achieve a modicum of you know, healing or, or, or some degree of, of acceptance, or we have to have that acceptance before we move forward. That's what this does. Well, House Resolution 662 is a number. But we are human beings. We are not numbers. It is important because, as you just mentioned, that healing starts from recognizing 
the underlying issues, the pain and the trauma. So if you're not recognized, healing cannot start from there. The recognition is important because from there onward, healing and reconciliation can begin. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, like many of you, we were angry too. We were scared. We were angry. But we didn't know who to lash out. We couldn't express our anger because we were scared. So once we became the victim of 9-11 hate crime, it doubled down on us that we not only paid a big price, but we never could express our frustration, our anger, and our fear. So since this incident happened to us, basically we went into hiding. We never could express our frustration, our feelings that what 9-11 did to us, rather we paid a big price. And since there was no hope from day one, there was no recognition, there was no support. That's why it is so important to finally as a nation to recognize the victims, families and survivors because we are human beings, we matter. We don't want to live in the shadow, in the darkness, every 9-11, because I spoke with um, Duri before, she said that every year in the month of September, in her family, there's no TV. They do not turn on the TV. There's so much trauma, so much pain, so much you know, anxiety and frustration. They do not watch TV in the month of September. I do the same. So what we're asking is a simple thing. As I said before, it's not a political issue. It's not a partisan issue. It's a human issue. And again, I have asked you, if we were your loved ones, what would you do? There is no reason for every member of Congress to support this resolution because it's a moral issue. I would say it's a moral obligation for all of us to come forward and say, we understand your pain. We are here to support you. We are here to help you to heal and finally find some closure and healing in your heart. The pain and the suffering you endured will never be replaced, but at least we can do something ba very basic, acknowledge your pain and do the best we can do. And that's why this resolution is really important to help us heal and reconcile. Mr. would you be able to do No, no, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, so this resolution is, is important and uh, I will reread a lot of the points that my colleague and Ray said. Uh, so I mean, on 9-11, like, I feel like we were attacked twice. We were attacked by the terrorists, our homes, our nation was under attack. And then we felt like also our nation attacked us, our government attacked us for the following. I mean, that's that's the, the reality for, for, like, for my generation that was just coming into high school, coming to college, that we started our, our you know, like our, let's say intellectual and awareness uh, life in being othered. Uh, when you get pulled over by the cops, you're terrified. Uh, when, uh, and, and I had friends that were actually pulled over by the cops they, that had cell phones with them and, and they were arrested for, for having bombs or something like that in Ohio. They would release the next day. So that's, I mean, it's not, it's, you know, uh, we, we were terrified of flying. We were terrified of crossing the border, of, of getting asked about any, like, you know, the patriot came up next, like, you know, politics going on in other parts of the world uh, for us to be blamed for it, for us to be questioned about it. And, and, and on top of that, you know, our, our, you know the, the victims of 9-11, of, of, of when they're mentioned, you know, they're, they're it's, it's, it's the victims that are more than just those who died and you know as, as to the four plane. Also, the victims that were killed by by, by the hate crimes that followed followed it, and and they're not acknowledged. Acknowledgement is very important. Acknowledge, I can't, sorry, acknowledgement is important because it it helps our nation heal. Like if if if, we, if a part of our nation is 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 not able to heal and not able to move forward, then the whole nation is not moving forward. And that ultimately is why you know, this resolution is very important. Just acknowledgement in itself will allow the nation to move forward with all its parts past what happened 21 years ago. I'm going to take this moment to read another statement 
um, that was offered in testimony today. This is um, from uh, uh, a woman named Alka Patel, widow of Vesuda Patel. On October 4, 2001, Mark Stroman shot and killed Vesuda Patel, a young Indian American father of two, while Patel was working at his convenience store in Sweden, Texas. A store video camera recorded the murder, allowing law enforcement detectives to identify Stroman as the killer. Stroman said during a television interview that anger over September 11 attacks caused him to attack any store owner who appeared to be Muslim. He further stated during the interview, where more I did what I had to do, I did it to retaliate thought against all those who retaliated against us. In addition to killing Patel, Stroman also shot and killed Walker Hassan in September 15, 2001, and also shot Rice and Moon. Uh, Stroman was tried and convicted of capital murder for killing Patel and sentenced to death on April 30th. Um, his widow offered this statement. My name is uh, Al my name is Alka Patel, and I am the mother of two wonderful kids, 34-year-old. Kuntal Patel, and 31-year-old Kamaxi Patel. In addition to being a mother of two, I am also a widow for 21 years and counting. On the morning of October 1, 2001, my husband, Sudip Patel, went to work at our convenience store, not knowing he would be shot and killed by a white supremacist, Mark Stroman. Through a series of investigations and trials, it was determined that the murder was the result of a hate crime, following the horrific tragedy of September 11, 2001. On that jury day, my 12-year-old son and nine-year-old daughter went to school not knowing they would come home to, the, to, to only their mother. The years followed, following this tragedy were filled with 16-hour work days for seven hours and seven days a week as I worked to support my two innocent children and keep my household afloat. In 2003, my son was diagnosed with depression and required counseling. Seeing my then 14-year-old son struggle with thoughts of suicide and lack of desire to go to school, meet or play, was just another reminder that this tragedy would affect us for the rest of our lives. I can still vividly recall waking up in the middle of the night with racing thoughts and feeling hopeless. I endured financial, emotional, mental, and physical hardships throughout these years to the point that I do not have words to describe these feelings to this day. During these tough times, I had the moral support of my parents to remind me that everything was for my children. Becoming a widow at 39 is something I would not wish on anyone, and the loss of my children, and I, the loss my children and I have suffered is no different than the loss of loved ones from the September 11, 2001 tragedy. Now that my kids are all grown up, I have retired, but the incident has not escaped us even to this day. We continue, continue to share stories of the husband and father we love to each other and to my grandkids to keep this memory alive. God bless you all, and I appreciate each and one of you for taking the time to listen to my story. So as we begin to move towards talking about the resolution itself and the letter that people can um, sign on to, I think one of the important themes of this day is is the commitment to this country. I mean, the, the description of yourselves as Americans, as uh, from Americans, these were Muslim Americans, Sikh Americans, Indian Americans, Coptic Americans, but they all understood themselves to be part of this country. And so I, I do wanna take a moment, especially in the halls where we are to recognize what a patriotic thing this effort is. This is, and, and how much you represent, for me as, you know, as an American, you represent the America I long for, I dream of. And so I'd just like to give anyone who wanted to, to talk a little bit about why this bill is actually deeply rooted in your, in your desire for the America that, that you dream of. I can I, I can just start by you know sharing where our push to support this legislation, our push to bring you all here, is one component of the American dream. It's one component of the experiment that is democracy. 
there is an issue that most of us, many of us feel passionate about and we want to see it go forward. Those people that were affected, including the ones on this dais, were done, they were, they were affected in the pursuit of the American dream. And now we are using the channels and using the tools through democracy to be able to acknowledge what they were, what some of what their husbands were, their fiancés were, and they themselves were prevented from achieving. It was the American dream that they were short, that they were shorted, but we are here today to be able to use our, our, our democracy to be able to recognize their own losses. Well, you know, I mean, the reason I came to America, leaving my Air Force career, was because that, that I mentioned in my, in my opening remark that, that America is a promise to its people. Despite all the challenges we see in our TV news, in social media, America is the, is still the beacon of hope and prosperity. And after 9-11, I personally did not feel any hope because of there was lack of support there was we just felt like that we were the the poster child of this nation there was no one to talk about us there was no one to come forward say no worries things would be okay there was not a there was no safe shoulder to lean on and to feel that even though we are going through tremendous downhill in our life but things will get better when we're down, when we go through tremendous pain and suffering, most of the people, they look for some hope, a gentle shoulder, a reassurance that things will get better. There was none for us. We survived based on resilience and the inner strength, based on the human capacity to move forward despite life-altering challenges. So this resolution is a hope for us that finally, even after 21 years later, our country, our government will do the next right thing by acknowledging that we are human beings. We went through pain and suffering and they have not forgotten us. That's why it is so important because this is what is America, the promise, the constitutional right, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Our happiness was interrupted. What Mrs. Patel, Mrs. Hassan went through, and also I, in the video you saw that Balabir Singh and everyone who was murdered, they will never come back. We'll never get them back. But we can do the very basic by acknowledging that their pain and suffering, what they went through, didn't go in vain. We acknowledge them. They're one of us. I mean, can you imagine when Balavir Singh was murdered, he was actually raising an American flag in front of his gas station. The day before, he emptied his wallet to a charity organization that was raising funds for the 9-11 victims. The day after, his life was taken. So that's why it is so important to pass this resolution. What Mrs. Hassan went through leaving four teenage daughters behind home at nighttime, working in a graveyard shift, six days a week in a factory. Can you imagine yourself leaving four teenage daughters at home and going to work six days a week in a factory with a minimum wage? Can you imagine yourself working in a gas station seven days a week, 15 hours per day, and growing two teenage daughters back home? If you he, if he cannot feel, we won't be able to move forward. We have to feel that what these people went through, otherwise we wouldn't be able to move forward. I think it's important to also talk about like what's in this resolution, because actually when I read it, I was like, so how much money should be, you know, I was like, I was, you know, you know, I just, I, I, it's actually not at all about money, it's not about, it's about recognition. I just want to make sure that people understand like what this bill is about. And and I wonder if like, I'm not sure that if everybody has a copy, but where can people see a copy of this bill? And, um, I want to make sure that people have a chance to read it because it really is just about dignity. It's about respect, it's about acknowledgement and it's about healing. 
So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. And then um, I think I'm going to turn it over uh, to you to, to talk a little bit about the letter that people can sign up onto. But does anybody want to talk about the resolution itself and why it's crafted the way it is um, uh, before we do that as a final? I can I can start. I just kind of uh, put together some some. Actually, why don't you Why don't you come up here yeah. and I'll, I'll step down and and you can kind of take it from here. Hello, uh, Muhammad here again. Um, you know, when I think about or what my thoughts were as I was going into some of the research required to kind of put this event together, it's my my initial thoughts were that like, healing cannot even be considered uh, when what we are attempting to heal isn't even acknowledged. So that's the that's the foundational concept of why we are here today. It's to recognize and honor the victims of hate crimes after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. And we've heard from the powerful testimony from the folks here on the left, my left, who, you know, like Rice miraculously survived such a heinous attack on his uh, life. Um, you know, we've heard from others who, who talked about their lives after they were widowed. And, and by the same assailant, and why? Why were they put into that position? Why did their lives get changed and altered in that way? And, and why were they of one of, of thousands? And it was just because they, they were either Muslim or American Muslims, or they looked like they were. Um, you know, they were, they were Americans, they were Sikhs, they were Hindus, they were Christians, they were Arabs or South Asians, all because, you know, people decided that they wanted to take their anger, their hatred, and attack those who they felt that they, it was their right to do so. And, and in doing so, it changed their lives forever. Now, nothing can reverse those losses, but we owe it to them to honor, to honor the faith they suffered. And what we are asking for is so simple, so basic. It shouldn't even, frankly, it shouldn't require today. We're just asking for recognition of those who lost their lives in the days following 9-11. Um, at the Muslim Public Affairs Council, we always seek to create opportunities to provide platforms, uh, you know, to folks to my left to, to share their stories, to elevate how, you know, the days after 9-11, how it has impacted their, their families in the, in the days after, all the way up until today. I mean, you've heard the powerful testimony, the tears that were mentioned, that's today, 21 years later, and there isn't even an acknowledgement in the, in, you know, by, in, through the language that we're hoping for. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, joining our coalition letter, which right now is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 35 organizations. Now these organizations are nonpartisan, interfaith organizations just trying to do the right thing is going to provide a boost to passing what is a very simple resolution. It's not asking for money to be earmarked for a memorial. It's not asking for creating a program to, you know, it's just, to rec recognize and honor those who were who were passed who, who lost their lives, um, like I mentioned before, as an advisor in the Senate, I often looked at the numbers of uh, constituents who were writing in, who were calling in, organizations that were doing the same. If I was able to share with my LD or with the chief of staff or the senator and saying, "Here's the right thing to do," and here are the numbers of people that are backing this, it would make my job a lot easier if I really believe that to be the right thing. This is going to make the job easier for members of Congress to make this, to do this the right, you know, to actually pass this. Now, it shouldn't require that, like I said, but here we are in the lame duck session weeks before this Congress convenes. So I think, Bakker, you mentioned that we're gonna circulate this letter towards the end of this week. Yes. So, you know, get those who you know, get those who are watching to get onto our letter so that we can circulate it with even more force. Um, I just, you know, like I said earlier, the ball is in our court. We have the ability through our democratic system to, to do something to change the lives. We can't change the lives of those who were affected in, in the days after 9-11, but we can let them know that we still think about them, that we still care. It is the only, it's the least that we can do. We want to be, we want there to be some modicum of acknowledgement. That is how we begin the healing process. And then we can go on and talk about policy solutions so that the hate that you mentioned, that the person who was who attacked, you mentioned that there's hate everywhere around the world or hate everywhere, that we can start to counter that hate. But let's start with at least acknowledging. With that, thank you.